Uh, I am Ryan Shaw. I am the, among other things, senior lead for Security and Defense Plus for Arizona State University. And in that capacity, I'm sure Ian's going to wrap us all up properly uh, once we're done with this panel. But from, from the ASU perspective, I'd like to thank all of you, all of our partners that have made this possible for two really great days of programming, including our partners at New America, our colleagues from King's College London and UNSW, and of course, all of you in the audience that have stuck with us uh, this long, including those who, uh, in the room and also those online, as Ian said to open this morning. One thing we know for sure about trying to do an event in DC is that everybody that's here has got somewhere else to be and something else to do, so we really appreciate you making the time and, and really appreciate you hanging with us for this long. I am uh, really thrilled to introduce this next panel. Uh, it's on regional perspectives on AUKUS. Now, our three universities are in the three AUKUS nations of the US, the UK, and Australia. And so most of our dialogue has been from that perspective, and it's been, uh, or from those perspectives, and about China. Uh, but those are far from the only players in the region, of course. We're leaving a whole lot of perspectives out. So we wanted to do a panel on other regional perspectives. But I was really committed to the idea that rather than having American or Australian or British experts tell us about the other countries, that we should really hear from those other countries. So I'm really pleased that we've managed to get the ambassador from the Philippines and the defense attache from Japan here. But I'm going to let the moderator introduce our guests and I'm going to introduce the moderator. It really is a pleasure to introduce Dave Maxwell. So he is the Vice President of the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy. I'd also like to acknowledge his boss, uh, Hee Yoon Kim, uh, who is the President of the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy. Appreciate their support and partnership on this panel. Um, but before that, Dave was at the Foundation for Defense for Democracies and dozens of other jobs. Uh, including a full career as a Special Forces Officer, uh, Green Beret, with extensive experience in the region. I'd like to call Dave the hardest working man in D.C., except he's never in D.C. Every time I try to connect with him, he's in Mongolia or South Korea or somewhere. He is, uh, com in whatever capacity he works, he is fully committed to the missions that bring us all here together. I've been a longtime admirer of, of him, his work ethic, and his, and his commitment to public service for all of our good, which expresses itself in lots of different ways. The one that I would like to especially acknowledge today, though, is that among the other projects he's done, uh, he has been the editor of the Small Wars Journal for years and years. And as we discussed yesterday, if you were here, the Small Wars Journal has for almost 20 years now, been the premier online forum for the exchange of ideas and debate between scholars and practitioners focused on small wars, irregular warfare, competitive statecraft, national security issues more generally. It's been a labor of love for him and some friends for a long time. As we announced yesterday, we're really pleased that ASU will be taking over uh, the publication of Small Wars Journal here in the next few weeks. We'll relaunch with a new website and everything. Uh, as we all know, and, and we've learned from public affairs recently, knowing when to hand the torch uh, for, a, for a project is, is a difficult thing to stomach, but Dave has done it very, very gracefully. He's been a great partner throughout, uh, and he's going to remain. He's not, he's not leaving the project. He will remain as our editor emeritus. Is that right? Contributing editor. <laughs> Contributing editor. So he'll, he'll remain with Small Wars Journal, but just wanted to thank a, take, take a special moment to thank Dave for all of the hard work that's brought us to this point, for sticking with us, uh, again, for the panel, also for partnership on the transition of Small Wars Journal, which we're really excited about. And with that, I will turn it over to, oh, and, and a reminder for all of you to be, please be looking uh, for the rebranded and relaunched Small, Small Wars Journal produced by Arizona State University in just a few short weeks. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Dave, and uh, thank you, Ryan. best of luck with the panel. Yep. And, uh, if you need a job as an agent, I will hire you, so thank you for the kind words. And, uh, and just let me say on Small Wars Journal, I, I took over as the editor when Dave DeLagy passed, and, uh, and we wanted to keep it going, and you know, I struggled for a couple of years to try to find a right home for it, and when I met Ryan and learned about ASU and I uh, you know, knew that was the right place for it. And so we're grateful to ASU uh, for taking this on because Small Wars Journal is a great, uh, uh, a great platform. It's done a lot of great things. And I know at ASU it's really going to, you know, 2.0 is going to be a great thing. And so I'm appreciative to ASU, uh, to President Crow, but for Ryan for really taking this on and for Ken Gleiman for, for leading the, uh, uh, the transition. So, uh, so welcome to our last panel. And as Ryan said, uh, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to uh, have the views from the region from those in the region. 
Uh, and so we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, ambassador from the Philippines and the military attache from Japan. I've had the honor of serving in both their countries. Uh, and so, uh, so this is a real pleasure uh, to have, have them here uh, with us. Um, the, uh, the ambassador uh, has been an ambassador here 2017. I, I was gonna say that he must be the longest serving ambassador, uh, but he told me that the ambassador from Palau has been here for, for 20 years. So, uh, But somebody who's been in Washington since 2017 certainly knows Washington uh, perhaps better than, than most of us. Um, the Admiral is a, a naval officer and a helicopter pilot, and something that's really uh, relevant to all of us here in AUKUS is that he, the, the aircraft he flies, the SH-60, is for anti-submarine warfare. Uh, so he's the one, uh, you know, who'll be out there, who has been out there searching for submarines. Not AUKUS submarines, but <laughs> Chinese submarines. So, uh, so he's got that, that, that relevant, uh, relevant experience. Uh, n now, uh, you know, we heard uh, uh, from, um, from H.R. McMaster yesterday uh, and how important it is to have strategic empathy, you know, to look at things from, from others' perspectives. So that's why uh, we're fortunate to have uh, here um, our, our two, uh, two distinguished panelists. I just want to set the stage with some graphics. We've been talking a lot about this, um, but the first one here, I just want to emphasize, again, what HR said about strategic empathy. This may be a view of China and looking at that arc of containment uh, to see how the U.S. and our friends, partners, and allies are really encircling uh, China in many ways. And so that, that, you know, we look at it from China's perspective. Uh, of course, we don't think that that's what we're doing, but I think it's important to, uh, uh, to look at it from that perspective. And I really think, though, that um, uh, we really need to look at, you know, the, the competition, the strategic competition. And you see here the Belt and Road Initiative or the old One Belt, One Road. Uh, and you look at our strategic competition. You know, obviously, our focus and really our three countries uh, are maritime countries. Uh, and so you look at the, the, the trade routes uh, that are so important to us. And then you see how, how China is trying to dominate uh, of course, overland, and then uh, and then all the way to to Africa, uh, and so you see this strategic competition uh, playing out. Now, of course, Flashpoint Taiwan, uh, you can see the differences in uh, in forces. Certainly, a a uh, PRC PLA Taiwan fight is uh, the correlation of forces is not in Taiwan's favor, uh, which is why uh, we have to be prepared to come to their defense as the U.S. and our friends, partners, and allies. Um, you know, we do have forces there. Uh, and, you know, as close as, uh, as uh, to Kinmen there, uh, you know, six miles away. Uh, and so this is, this is the flashpoint. Uh, but uh, to steal from the ambassador, uh, you know, the real, uh, the real dangerous place may be the West Philippine Sea. Uh, and I think we... We understand the, the West Philippine Sea uh, versus the South China Sea. Uh, but that may be the flashpoint that's more dangerous than Taiwan. And I won't steal any more thunder from the, uh, from the ambassador. Uh, but I want to, I use this slide a lot in my lectures on Indo-Pacific security. Uh, and so I, since last February, I've always been referencing the, the ambassador there. Uh, and I think it's important to, uh, uh, to understand that perspective there. So, uh, so with that, um, you know, Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific is a, uh, you know, it is a, we would say a chessboard, but, you know, in Asia, in China, it's more like the Go board. Uh, and it is all about those stones on the territory. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, right now I would say that, uh, that uh, we, are, we are competing, and this is really kind of the essence of, of, uh, of competition. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over for remarks, first from the ambassador and then from uh, the admiral. So, ambassador, over to you. Thank you very much, Colonel Dave. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the New America Arizona State University and the King's College London and the University of New South Wales for inviting and organizing this forum and inviting me to speak about the Indo-Pacific region where we, the Philippines is uh, located, of course. 
a region that has increasingly become the center of attention, so to speak, in, 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 in many ways because of what's happening in our part of the world. Um, you know, the Philippines has never faced this type of challenge uh, since World War II, and um, it has become increasingly even more, uh, I would say, challenging, and at the same time, uh, we are playing a, a thin line here between trying to use diplomacy and using our armed forces and our alliances uh, to be able to deter China from doing what they're doing. As of today, they have about 238 ships or militia vessels swarming in the our area, and they continue to do this day in and day out. They only left for a while when there was a typhoon or a uh, storm, but they're back again, this time much bigger than before. While we continue to try and use diplomacy, as I said, as a way to be able to uh, have a civil conversation with our neighbors to the north, we also have to continue to try and find ways and means to be able to strengthen our alliances. And that's the reason why we had the trilateral summit here in Washington, D.C. last April, where we had a strong um, um, uh, alliance with Japan and the United States. We also are reaching out to other countries as well. We believe in the minilateral mini approach, at the same time the multilateral approach into uh, finding a way to give a signal to China that we're not just one, but we're many that are not happy with what they're doing today in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. And I, I think that it's, it's also important to note that um, as we try to uh, increase our or our, we're trying to modernize our armed forces. It's important to note that there are many other countries that have already indicated that they would like to join uh, many of these multilateral approaches and, and, and diplomatic uh, forays that we're having. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the coming weeks ahead, we are planning to have some sort of like a summit in the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly where we're gonna have at least 20 nations that will join us into seeing and finding ways to be able to talk uh, uh, some sense into, uh, into uh, to the PRC. Um, President Marcos has been very clear from the very beginning that we were never going to start a conflict in our area. But we are also very clear that we are not going to give one inch of our territory. And it's very important to note that if we do, if we lose just one, it's like a domino effect. You can be sure that if it, if it happens to us, it'll happen to the other nations as well. And so we, we are also talking now to our neighbors, especially those that have the same territorial uh, claims in the same area like Malaysia, Brunei, and uh, Vietnam. And we have uh, indicated to them that we have to find ways to be able to bond together and also approach China that we do not include the other countries that are supposedly not in the area, but that we can talk to them in a more civilized way again to be able to find a solution to the uh, territorial claims that they have. As, as you're well aware, they started with 9-dash line. They're now on 10-dash line. Who knows? They may go up to 11, 12, 13, the entire area. But there are eight nations that are actually affected by that 10 dash line that they have uh, put out. And so while, that, while they're saying that, we have 15 other nations that believe that they're not following the international rule of law. And so it is a multilateral, minilateral approaches that we believe is going to be the, the right way to go and to give the right signal to China. I'm, I'm gonna stop there to give uh, Colonel Dave, and of course, our friend from Japan, uh, more. Thank you. You know, you talk about the multilaterals and minilaterals. Earlier, we heard on a couple panels, uh, the U.S. is kind of describing that as a, a lattice work. And, uh, but, you know, a lattice, to me, is kind of weak. You know, and, and, you know, think of the vines growing up there. What you're really describing, and I think something we should adopt, it's, it's really more like a silk web. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and a silk web is, is strong, flexible. Uh, and so I think that 
that, that would be a better analogy, and I think that's what you're really describing with the minilaterals and, and multilaterals. Yes, absolutely. So, Admiral, over to you. First of all, thank you for having me, and it's a privilege honor for me to be here today. As I have uh, been given this opportunity, so I'd like to express Japan's defense policy situation and my personal views. So since the end of World War II, Japan has been determined not to repeat the scourge of war and has sought to build a peaceful nation. To this end, the constitution of Japan prescribes the renunciation of war and provision of war potential and the denial of the right of belligerency. However, after the 1947, uh, constitution came into effect. Japan was faced with Korean War and the threat of Soviet Union. And the self-defense forces were created to respond to this threat. After the Gulf War, Japan recognized the importance to Japan's security of building a stable international community with ally and like-minded countries. And 1991, the first time maritime self-defense force minesweeper was dispatched to clear mines in the Persian Gulf. Ten years later, in 2001, the maritime self-defense force supply ship was deployed to Indian Ocean to refuel the naval vessels of various countries engaged in anti-terrorism operation in the Indian Ocean. And ten years after that, SDF carried out rescue operations after the Great East Japan earthquake. During that time, the ground self-defense forces and air self-defense forces deployed to Iraq and some countries to participate in a various peacekeeping operation. As the rule of the SDF changed with the changing international situation, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 was a turning point that significantly changed Japan's thinking on security. In particular, the innovation of Ukraine by permanent member of the UN Security Council, ignoring the provision of the UN Charter, strongly impressed upon the Japanese that was between countries are not imaginary, but real. Japan's proximity to <coughs> countries, excuse me, China, as, uh, such as China, Russia, and North Korea, which have different values from those of Japan, is a major security concern. Under these circumstances, the role of the self-defense force has also been significantly reviewed. And in December 2022, the so-called strategic three documents were enacted. In addition to doubling the defense budget, the strategic three documents also decided to further expand the role of the SDF, including the possession of counter-strike capability and the establishment of the JJOC, Japan Joint Operations Command. But another thing to note is that the three strategic documents emphasize the promotion of multilateral cooperation and the strengthening of ties with international frameworks. Every nation usually has a national interest, securing sovereignty and national prosperity. In addition, the 2022 National Security Strategy defines the national interest as defending the international order based on universal values and international law, including freedom, democracy, fundamental human rights, and the rule of law. In particular, maintaining and developing a free and open international order in the Indo-Pacific. To promote the third national interest, Japan needs to be actively involved in the framework of international cooperation and with 
uh, work with allied and like-minded country to maintain and develop the current international order. From this perspective, the court and the AUKUS are important framework for Japan. Unlike Europe, it is difficult for countries in the, in the Pacific region to organize and cooperate in a single comprehensive framework. There are various political systems, religions, cultures, ethnic groups, and customs in the Indo-Pacific region, and it is not realistic to establish a comprehensive international organization based on common values. In Europe, the southern states emerged in the 16th century and overcame many tragedies to establish institutions such as NATO and European Union. While most of the southern nations in Asia have a history of less than 100 years, it is still difficult to establish a large international organization in the Indo-Pacific region. Therefore, I think it is important for the Indo-Pacific region to establish a limited interstate framework among a limited number of states with common interests in certain areas, such as the court and ASEAN, in order to promote regional stability. And through such an interstate framework, I think it is important to spread the values we strive for, such as freedom and democracy. Europe, despite many such, you know, sacrifices, uh, sacrifices, eventually found common values and established NATO and the European Union. However, these values are not always shared in the Indo-Pacific region. And while technology cooperation is important for AUKUS, I think the ultimate goal is to secure technological superiority through cooperation in the defense industry in order to spread our common values. Japan shares common values with the US and Europe, and it is in Japan's national interest to spread these values throughout the Indo-Pacific region. The success of AUKUS will not only be a technological success, but also lead to technological advantages and the spread of common value we strive for in the Indo-Pacific region on the back of the such advantages. Thank you. And you know, both of you have, uh, have really uh, given us the common ties, which again, reinforces that silk web. I, I think our foundation, uh, you know, our common values, and it is the rules-based international order that, that's in all of our interests to, uh, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to uphold and, and to live by. Um, so the, the question that I, I'd like to start with is that uh, one of the things the United States we talk about is our strategic competition with China. China is uh, a competitor. China is... Um, our defense, our national defense strategy calls it uh, the pacing threat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we are in this strategic competition. And so I'd like to know from the Philippines' perspective and from Japan's perspective, you know, how that affects your country and how you view that competition uh, between China and the United States. Well, I think, first of all, I, I think it's, it's, it's not really competition anymore, but I think China would like to dominate uh, they, they would like to be the superpower uh, to dominate, uh, especially the, in the Indo-Pacific region. They've always said on many occasions that this is our, this is our neighborhood. You should not bring in the outsiders, They're referring always to the United States and other Western countries. Uh, but we do welcome this, uh, uh, this strategic competition dialogue that, uh, between uh, the United States and China, which we hope will amount to some form of an agreement of some sort that will, will keep uh, some stability in the area. Uh, but we're, we're very skeptical to a certain extent because of their, their position that, uh, that the Indo-Pacific region, or specifically what they say about the nine dash line and the 10 dash line, is that is a territory that uh, belongs to them, which again, will affect obviously the, the freedom of navigation. And so, 
The bottom line is I think that the approach to China will always have to be on very cautious way and that a continuing, uh, a continuing um, multilateral uh, dialogue between other countries, including especially the ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN community, is very important for the United States to, uh, to bring on into the table and to be able to give the message that this is a region that believes in the international order. And I think that that's the only way that we can deal with China now at this time. And what would you like to? So uh, competition between the US and China is uh, partly a struggle for hegemony between the two major power. But I also believe that it is a competition of values. So China's domestic governance has an authoritarian aspect mm -hmm. and uh, the way of thinking in China can be considered to apply to the international community. I think that the international order that China is aiming for is uh, the former authoritarian East Asian international order centered on China before 17th century, as evidenced by the dream of the revival of Chinese nation. Mm -hmm. Such values are incompatible with uh, democratic country such as Japan, the United States, and European countries. Japan, along with the United States and partners, aim to maintain the existing, existing uh, international order based on freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. So I believe it is important to promote technology cooperation with these countries, secure technology advantages, promote common values, and prevent attempts to change the status quo, status quo by force. Great. Um, and, and let me ask you, um, Admiral, what is, what is your assessment of, of AUKUS? How, how do you view AUKUS? So the, as the Prime Minister Kishida said, uh, Ukraine today is East Asia, could be the East Asian tomorrow. And the situation in various parts of the world affect each other. So in this context, uh, AUKUS is uh, expected to contribute to the stability of each region by strengthening the comprehensive technological capabilities of countries of Indo-Pacific region and West. So I also believe that the cooperation among the three technologically advanced countries will shorten the development period of the, for equipment incorporating advanced technology and is an important framework for ensuring the technological superiority of peer countries that which share the same values as Japan. You know, I just have to make this comment. I wish that uh, our earlier panels, uh, hopefully somebody's here from the earlier panels, uh, as we talked about the, the narrative of AUKUS and getting the message out about AUKUS, I think both the ambassador and the admiral have just demonstrated, I mean, what they have said about AUKUS is exactly what, uh, you know, I think uh, the United States, Australia, and, and the UK have wanted the message to get out. They are, they are giving us feedback, I think, that is very important. And, and so, um, you know, from a, uh, you know, an influence perspective, uh, a target audience analysis is giving us the feedback, uh, you know, and uh, this is the post test uh, for our, our, our you, have, you have really uh, demonstrated an understanding of, of, of AUKUS that, uh, that frankly, from the earlier panels, it didn't seem like people really understood. I mean, we, we were critical of whether we are properly explaining AUKUS. And, uh, and your comments illustrate that, uh, that I think that message is getting out. I think, uh, I think that's, that's really, um, and, and I'm really happy to hear that. Uh, and our, our panelists from uh, earlier should, should be as well. Um, and, and so you've talked about technology, and of course Japan has, has advanced defense technolog technological capabilities. Um, and, uh, but I look from the Philippines, is there anything that you, you would like to um, perhaps um, uh, 
coordinate with AUKUS or any, any kind of, do you see any kind of relationship with AUKUS or uh, is, it, is, it, you know, is it sufficient to have the minilaterals and multilaterals? Is there, is there something you would like from AUKUS uh, specifically uh, for, uh, for your national security interests? Well, I, well, we were one of the first, uh, when, when there was an announcement to AUKUS, we, we were one of the first countries to support it in the Indo-Pacific region. There, the other countries were a little bit skeptical on, on what this thing was all about. It, it was, but in our case, we saw that uh, as, as, a, uh, as a sign once again that there is a commitment uh, coming from the Western world, most specifically uh, the AUKUS, uh, Australia, UK, um, and the United States, um, that they are committed to finding uh, peace and stability in the area by using whatever it is, whatever means they have. Uh, and again, it's also important that that message uh, was made clear. Uh, but what we would like to see is more activity in terms of not only on the defense side, but on economic activity, which also involves def defensive, uh, uh, as, as the Admiral said, technology that can be that can, that can be used uh, for defense at the same time for for economic uh, prosperity for for the nations in the area because economic prosperity means economic security for all uh, because China today uses economic coercion as one way of being able to uh, force a country to choose sides this is the kind of thing that we would like to avoid is that we we want to choose the right side which is what we believe in our values, the free, free and Indo-Pacific region, uh, free and open and peace uh, and stability. So that I think is the, the role that AUKUS can, can, can play by giving that as an indication of how strongly they support uh, uh, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific region in terms of not only defense, as I said, but also on the economic front. Okay. so. Yeah, I guess, I, you know, from listening to the, the AUKUS experts, I, I don't know if there was an economic component uh, to that, but I think that's a really, uh, I think that's a, uh, something really think about. Uh, um, but it, then I might also ask then, maybe rather than AUKUS, maybe Quad would be, you know, Quad is more of a, um, has more of an economic focus mm -hmm. uh, than, um, uh, than AUKUS, I, I think. You know, would, would the Quad be, um, be suited then to take on the role of, of helping to defend against China's economic coercion or economic warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, uh, if, if you think the Quad would be useful to, to the Philippines? Well, I, I, like, like I said, any, any, any kind of um, uh, organization or institution that can, 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 can use those two points, which is defense and the economic, uh, as, as, as a way to be able to deter China from trying to dominate the region is a key factor. Uh, just a, uh, as a case in point, uh, today obviously India, for instance, is, is an economic power as it is right now. It's an economic powerhouse. But they have, for the first time, have openly supported a free uh, and, and, and peaceful Indo-Pacific region. Uh, they, they are been very supportive. They have supported the Philippines as far as the arbitration award and 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 they they haven't done this uh, in, i can't remember any and any other time so this gives you an indication once again that the more countries uh band together and give a message to china that what they're doing is definitely not on the right side of history then we have a better than even chance that they will not make that wrong move that we're all fearing. So, Admiral, would um, and I think you you've kind of alluded to this uh, in your comments about technology and things. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to put you on the spot uh, to say should Japan join AUKUS, but in general, do you think AUKUS should be expanded between uh, beyond the three countries? Do you think there's the potential for that? And and is that something that should be explored? Yes, um, like a, you know the. AUKUS member, the, they share the same common value. So democracy, human rights, something like that. So with the, that kind of the framework, 
which composed of the same value or very close relation should be expanded more deepen the relation. So that kind of framework should be more you know, the, the security alliance or something like that. But uh, generally speaking, that the Indo-Pacific region is composed of the very, as I mentioned before, that uh, diversity countries. So it's difficult to make a, you know, the big or large framework in that region. So I think the, this is, it is effective, not AUKUS, but uh, other framework, it is effective to establish a framework with a limited scope for a specific purpose in a specific, specific area. And it is important to effectively utilize that kind of framework to promote regional stability. And whilst it is important to aim for shared common values throughout the Indo-Pacific region in the long term, I believe that uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, which is rich in the diversity, it may be more necessary in short term to launch the smaller frameworks for specific purposes and to promote cooperation among members' countries as a first step. Yeah, I think I, I'm hearing both of you say very similar things. And I, you know, again, um, earlier we, we talked, people talk about one of the criticisms of AUKUS and, and in general, you know, is are we trying to bring NATO to Asia? And I think you've made the point and, you know, that, that NATO is not an appropriate model for Asia. And in fact, you know, those who know their history, we did try NATO, Northeast Asia Treaty Organization. We tried CEDO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. We had CENTO, Central uh, uh, Treaty Organization. So we've, we've tried these in the past, but they had never, you know, they never took hold. And I think that's because Asia is different than, than Europe. And, uh, and so, but I think, you know, you're talking about small frameworks, you're talking about minilaterals, multilaterals. I think that's really, um, uh, really worth exploring. And then of course, the most important thing uh, that you are both are saying is talking about shared values. And I think that's the difference uh, that we that that really exists between between us, uh, our friends, partners, and allies, uh, and uh, those revisionist powers in our national security strategy. China and Russia are revisionist powers, rogue powers of of Iran and North Korea, or as Christopher Ford uh, coined the term in uh, this past July that I'm I'm kind of enjoying and, and starting to use the dark quad. You know, the dark quad. I think that's something we should, uh, we should think about to describe them. And as I, as I think about them, you know, and, and why they are banding together, you know, there's really four things that, uh, that, are, that are bringing that dark quad together. And that, that's, that's fear, weakness, um, desperation, and envy. They fear our relationships. They fear our our values-based relationships that are based on trust and, and values, uh, they are weak because of their internal political contradictions. Uh, and they are all weak domestically uh, in their political situations. They're desperate. Certainly, Russia is desperate for North Korean aid. North Korea is desperate for, uh, for Russian, uh, uh, Russian technology and, of course, desperate for Chinese aid. Uh, and they're also envious. They're envious because they know they can never have relationships that we have. And, you know, so I think that's something to think about. And I, I just mentioned that because I, I hear that in your comments and, uh, well, and that our, our uh, you know, the, the foundation <coughs> is our shared values. And I think that's really important for us. Well, that's why. So it's, it's, it's dark, dark quad, it's dark cloud. Dark cloud. Yes, well, it is. They bring in the dark cloud. Yeah. I, I think that that's great. I'm going to have to have to borrow that. Okay. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, for, uh, for questions, and we got a lot of questions, but the first hand was Dr. Uh, Bu Bu uh, John, John. Um, thank you, really interesting views, uh, uh, getting the views from Japan and the Philippines. Ambassador and Admiral, I wonder if you could just perhaps comment on how you view the rest of ASEAN, the other Southeast Asian countries, uh, and maybe Korea, the R Republic of Korea, how, how, they, how they are viewing um, 
uh, engagement with the AUKUS arrangement, with you, with the US alliance. Uh, there's a lot of, the, in, a, in the Australian media, there's a lot of talk about stuff that happened a couple of years ago, or reactions in places like Indonesia. Uh, but what we've seen from you, your remarks, is that quite a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing that kind of uh, more measured, uh, maybe even supportive uh, argument, line of reasoning, coming from ASEAN partners or, or counterparts in the Republic of Korea? Thank you. Well, I, well for, for, I think the ASEAN, uh, to a certain extent, um, <coughs> While they view AUKUS as uh, something that they are concerned about, at uh, least some of the other countries, but most of us, most of the ASEAN, and I, I, I think I can mention some of them who have the same uh, problems that we do, like Malaysia and uh, Brunei and uh, Vietnam, uh, see this as a way to balance off whatever China is doing. So AUKUS is, is more or less welcome. But to other countries, Again, the, the economic part of, of, of the whole equation comes into play. Uh, they're more concerned. Indonesia, for instance, has a lot of trade going now with China. Laos and Cambodia, we, we, we know where they're coming from also, and, um, and the other countries. Uh, so th that is where we differ in terms of, of how we view AUKUS. As AUKUS could be a problem for them, but for us, we see it as a way to balance off some of the uh, uh, the uh, issues that surrounding our the Indo-Pacific region. Admiral, so each country has uh, each national interest and each political dis uh, direction. So, as I mentioned, the uh, Asian country has a different view and a far different perspective. In that situation, so it is difficult to share the common value, but uh, we can cooperate in some field like uh, economy or you know with uh, some country. On the other hand, we can cooperate in another field. So at first, we should find uh, some you know field we can cooperate each other, and we progress the trust, mutual trust. And then we should move on the next step. So it takes time because the Asian countries are so very you know, variety country. So, but uh, we should, you know, progress the step by step, especially in the, some field which we can cooperate together. Uh, Ryan, since you're the boss. If only that were true. Uh, Ryan Shaw, Arizona State University, as mentioned. Um, thank you very much, both of you, again, for being here and for your comments. You both mentioned the rules-based international order, and that's a term that we've heard a lot today. It's the thing that we're all committed to defending and preserving, and our method of preserving that is deterrence. So we talk a lot about deterrence. And it's, as we discussed in a morning panel, it's embodied in each of our national security strategies one, in one way or another. Um, but deterrence is, by definition, it's about what we don't want to have happen. And I've always thought, this is my critique of our collective strategies here, is that given the combined might of the three AUKUS nations and just military might, not to mention all of our collective soft power, and then you add in our other regional allies and, and allies and friends across the globe, I'd like to think we could achieve something more and aim a little bit higher than just not having anything happen. And while we're really committed to the status quo because it's been very good to us. It's always been my sense that there are other players here who are less enamored with the status quo than we are. And so if our message is, please join with us in making sure that nothing ever happens, that's probably not all that inspiring to potential partners. So I wonder, I'd like to give either of you the opportunity, if you'd like to say something about some change you would like to see. If you could change the status quo in a positive way, which again, I'd like to think is something we could aim at, uh, what, what changes would you like to see in the region? So what would you think, what would you like to see change in a positive way that would serve your interests? Yes. That, is that Well, I think, again, I just have to go back to the basic word, economic prosperity. Why economic prosperity? Because if, if, if the ASEAN, let's just talk about the ASEAN. 
if uh, the ASEAN region was 650 million people, if we have enough uh, economic activity between the ASEAN region and the AUKUS or the Western world, you have a market both ways. So this is the prosperity that we want. And therefore, if it's seen by those in the other side of the fence, meaning China, Iran, and everything, that is where you, 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 again, the word deterrence comes in. But you do it in a way that's positive because economic prosperity for those that follow the rules-based order. That is, that, that is the message that we need to give at all times. And, and, and that is how you can change that. Deterrence in the defense, obviously, is very clear why. But if, if you have economic prosperity that goes both ways, uh, then you have a, a, a stronger position as far as vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the, the quad, the, uh, what do you call that, the, uh, the dark quad. The dark quad. The dark quad. Admiral? Uh, as the Prime Minister Abe, former Prime Minister Abe, is, uh, insisted that the whip, the freedom of free open in the Pacific, that concept that all nations uh, how do you say, the share that, that value is a very the ultimate goal because the each every country has the same goal, like uh, you know, free open democracy and the uh, rule of the law. So each every country have a chance to develop. But if the, for example, the authoritarian country, China, dominant power in that region, so some of the country have no chance to develop. So our favorable situation is all countries share the same value as the, the democratic country. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, our favorite. That's, and also work as a deterrence. Because you know, the, if the China have a no uh, allied or partners, and the other countries cooperate each other, that shows a big, very strong deterrence against Chinese aggression. So I, I think you you make me think of something here that you you said, and I think that it was Prime Minister Abe that really coined the term Indo-Pacific and free and open Indo-Pacific. I think that, you know, the United States, we use that quite liberally, but I think that really emanated, mm -hmm. uh, it came from Prime Minister Abe. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think that's something uh, we should keep in mind. I got one, one minute left, one short question. One short question. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Rapansky, unaffiliated. Maybe this is a question for, uh, for the Admiral. Uh, about Russia and AUKUS. Uh, do you see that AUKUS might help uh, Japan feel more secure about uh, Russia doing anything malign in that South Korea Peninsula, China triangle, so to speak? Or disputed islands in <laughs> of Japan. <laughs> so I believe that, you know, the AUKUS is uh, the composed of the democratic country. And their goal is uh, almost the same as the, our you know, Japanese goal. So that you know, superiority of the technological advantages and uh, you know, this cooperation maybe the establish the superiority of in terms of the technological area. So that kind of development function as a strong deterrence. And if the Japan now Japan is seeking for and you know try to join the AUKUS pillar too and if the Japan joined that framework that also the contribute to Japanese the modernization of the defense capability and the very strong deterrence against the authoritarian country thank you and now we're going to close it I just like to say uh, uh, this has been really enlightening and great. And I just, on, on behalf of the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy, where I work, and uh, President uh, Hyun Kim, uh, we have 33 practitioners from all these countries, ASEAN, throughout all about the Indo-Pacific. And this is exactly what we, uh, we believe in, is these relationships, uh, our friends, partners, and allies, this silk web. Uh, we are all about, like defense and security, like 
uh, you know, ASU and, and New America, we're really grateful for, for uh, putting on this conference and allowing us to participate because uh, we believe this is really, really important. So uh, please give a hand to our great panelists. Thank you.